YouTube. This is Jack. I'm here today with Jim. We have a pretty special interview for you today. Usually, obviously, we do Star Wars here on Star Wars Collections and Displays, but Jim has a fantastic vintage, and when I say vintage, I mean vintage G.I. Joe collection. Every time I come to Jim's house, I see this collection, I ask him about the collection, and I told him I think our viewers need to see and know about this collection. So that's the special edition Star Wars Collections and Displays. Today, it's G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe, fighting man, perfect to go on the land, on the sea, in the air. G.I. Joe has come! Boom, boom! G.I. Joe, take that! Jim, let's get right into it, if you don't mind. How did you first get into collecting G.I. Joe? Well, as a kid of the 60s, I grew up with the toys then. There would be the metal pedal cart that you could be in. There would be the, the Tinker Toys and Lincoln Logs. And in the mid-60s, um, G.I. Joe came along, which spoke to many of us as, as boys. Um, but there was a little bit of a stigma there, because for all intent and purpose, these were dolls. And I remember my grandparents buying my stuff. I remember my parents buying me stuff. But I also remember at one specific point in time, Dad made a comment about boys don't play with dolls. And the, the unique irony about that was a stigma that was applied to all young boys at the time. And I believe the term action figures is where... Uh, is that term came about as a way of differentiating uh, G.I. Joe from dolls. I, I think I've heard this uh, as well. I think you're absolutely correct. I think it was an executive from the Hasbro company of the time that specifically said, hey, let's call these action figures to sell to the boys and not dolls, which were selling to the girls. Right, 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 so, right. Wow, so it came right from that company the very company that we're talking about as we look at your G.I. Joe collection yes. today. Yes, exactly. And to take a few steps backwards, a little history on Hasbro, uh, the company that made the G.I. Joe, and it was actually called Hasenfeld Brothers, which started in 1923 in Rhode Island, and they were making pencil boxes and school supplies. And somewhere around 1963, 1962, maybe 61, uh, one of the executives within Hasbro uh, decided that there was a, a, a movie out, if I recall right, I think it was called um, The Lieutenant. Um, and that's where kind of the foundation of the G.I. Joe toy or doll came from. And apparently one of the days he was walking down some street in New York City and spotted a... Um, artist sculpture in the window there that had a number of points of articulation and he kind of got that idea uh, to maybe make a doll or what would become an action figure uh, and that was kind of the birth of uh, those two things of G.I. Joe in combination with not only World War II and the Korean War um, that young boys would be interested in army type figures. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what was it specifically about G.I. Joe that got you, the boy, interested as opposed to some of these other toy lines that are out there? Um, I don't think at the time there was a competitive line to the G.I. Joe. Um, but again, it was toys for boys and it accommodated or, or, or paralleled the desire or the interest in playing army. Um, I have a childhood friend by the name of Richie, and I've known him since third grade. And every time I think of the beginning uh, of our relationship or friendship, it sprang from him and I playing Army in the school uh, playground. And it just kind of grew from there. So that idea of playing Army, uh, Rat Patrol was a TV series, I think, that was popular at that time. And so that also kind of brought the G.I. Joe, we could play Rat Patrol and, you know, ch -ch -ch -ch, bang, 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 and kind of just have fun modeling that stuff ourselves. 
Interesting. And take me back to that era. I, I wasn't around in the 1960s. I didn't come until the early 70s, mid-70s is when I really started understanding things around me. But from what I know of the late 50s into the 60s, cowboys and Indians were a big thing. Am I wrong to say that there weren't cowboys and Indians then? Why military and not cowboys and Indians for you? Well, I also remember a TV show called F Troop. Uh, that was about basically cowboys and Indians. Um, and I just, I don't remember uh, toys specifically that were comparable to the G.I. Joe that would be a cowboy or an Indian. Uh, it may have been that there were a number of them and maybe to whomever came up with the original idea for G.I. Joe saw an opportunity to have something similar and yet not copy what was already out there. I see, I see. So let's get, let's dive into your actual collection now if we can. Uh, it looks like a numerous amount of, of these 11 and a half inch action figures, G.I. Joe based action figures. Are they all G.I. Joe, or some of them different lines that look like G.I. Joe? How does that work? Well, most of them are G.I. Joe that are back here. There's a few, if you want to call them counterfeit ones. Um, Hasbro also licensed a company in England called Palatoy mm -hmm. to manufacture some of their products. And so there's a slight variation there. There's also a company out of Canada that Hasbro... I think acquired, but they're referred to as the Canadian G.I. Joe or the Canadian Hasbro, and so there'll be some little variations there. Um, the original G.I. Joes consisted of um, a, as I mentioned, an artist uh, sculpture or statue that was uh, bendable in many different ways. Um, and what I think the odd irony, odd uniqueness about this, when I began to shop for G.I. Joe, was people so that they would reference the validity of G.I. Joe, in particular when they were manufactured, is they would post pictures of naked G.I. Joes. In particular, always with the butt shot. And it seemed rather peculiar to me in the very beginning, but I soon realized that stamped on one of his buttocks is the manufacturing date. And so that's how people tend to validate uh, the authenticity and when the G.I. Joes were manufactured. It's just odd or weird uh, that it was on a butt cheek. Um, but these were the original G.I. Joes with the many points of articulation. Um, the original line was a, uh, a Marine, a Army, uh, a Navy, and a, um, uh, 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 a Navy, Army, Marine, Air Force uh, guy. Uh, and so the original line started off with those four characters. Uh, and I think it was four basic characters, and where the variations began to come from would be the outfits that you could clothe them in. And so this being a sailor here, um, this being another version of a sailor, and so you could have the same character uh, or the same model or, or G.I. Joe, and yet it would be dressed differently, and so it could become a different character. Um, I think there was something like um, 63 original variations in uniforms that were offered with the four original characters. Interesting. So, like a Barbie, once you had the G.I. Joe action figure, you could dress it up, undress it, kind of change it around to your own liking. Is that something that you remember doing as a boy? Would you undress and dress your G.I. Joes? Yes, and in particular, the G.I. Joes that I fondly remember uh, would be the Frogman G.I. Joe, and in particular, the Deep Sea Diver G.I. Joe. And what I recall about these is there's a nozzle or a nipple here on the back side that you could attach an airline to, and as little kids, we had one of those doughboy pools. And you could submerse the deep sea diver into the pool, and then with that hose, blow air through there, and he would be like he was breathing down in the water. And so these are the two characters that I remember most fondly, uh, and partly because of those accessories. Uh, but there was also, as I mentioned, the Army G.I. Joe, um, which came with, um, there were accessories that began to come out 
with those G.I. Joes beyond just the outfits that they would wear. Uh, and it could be accessories such as um, uh, artillery or rifles, or in this case, uh, there were scenes <laughs> and stories that you could get, uh, this being the white tiger hunt, and there'd be various accessories you could get for it. Uh, in particular, there was the, uh, the other one that I remember was the G.I. Joe Jeep that had a trailer that you could drive, uh, pull behind it, and on one of the, 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 the Jeep, I think, was a spotlight, and on the, uh, the, the trailer itself was a, a, a cannon of sorts. And then in the Jeep, it didn't have a motor per se, but it was a battery-driven um, little beater that would spin around and give you the sound of a motor inside. Them. Oh, that's cool. Uh, so I do remember those two toys as well. Very cool. And they were to the scale that these action figures are? That it wasn't a smaller Jeep? It was a pretty big size Jeep to be able to accommodate this scale yes. figure? Yes, you could put G.I. Joe into the Jeep and he would snugly fit inside there. That's incredible. Uh, hold up the two diver figures again because that actually is interesting to me. I again wasn't around from this era of G.I. Joe, but I am very familiar with the real American hero era of G.I. Joe. And when I look at those two action figures, I'm seeing Deep Six in your left hand and Wetsuit in your right hand. And just as you said, with Deep Six, there's a little hose that you can attach to them and you can kind of pump air and it creates bubbles. When you have Deep Six underwater, that's the original Deep Six. That's the original <laughs> Deep Six, exactly. I'm sure that these were served as the foundation for the future uh, variations, whether they be in size or, or scale, uh, but these served as the original uh, patterns for them. And if you don't mind, hold up the uh, Navy guys again here, uh, because I have a reference for the Navy guys also to a real American hero. So there is an action figure that is very much Navy in the current G.I. Joe, or at least the G.I. Joe from the 80s, and his name is Shipwreck. <laughs> and he comes with a little uh, parrot that you can put on his shoulder or his arm. Did either of these two figures come with a parrot? No, no I do not remember <laughs> the parrot at all. Uh, not at all. But it is interesting that you pulled up the white tiger as an accessory, and they did follow that into the next generation by giving some of these action figures, the three and three quarter inch action figures, some animal accessories yes. as well. Yes. Very, very cool. Um, and then in addition to the Jeep and the trailer, uh, there were other things such as, um, I forget exactly what this is called, and this is a later generation, but we'll call it a, a ski jet of some sorts. Uh, there was the um, space capsule, because in the 60s was the period of uh, going to the moon and such. And so there's a space capsule and a space capsule G.I. Joe. Hmm. Uh, and then there's a, a space walk G.I. Joe as well. And they're hung up up here. Uh, and then, ironically, right alongside G.I. Joe in the helicopter. Wow. Wow. And again, very reminiscent of some of the current G.I. Joes that are out there, especially the helicopter. Uh, G.I. Joe has a very famous Tomahawk helicopter that they sell that comes with the pilot. I don't remember specifically a space astronaut G.I. Joe. There is a, uh, I think in like 1985, 1986, there was a space uh, vehicle that did come out, but I don't remember exactly what, what figure came with that one. Uh, but going back to some of these other action figures that you have here, who was the enemy of G.I. Joe back during this time? I don't remember them making an actual enemy. You kind of made up your own enemies or took the positive, uh, the high road, uh, and, and dealt with... Uh, the, 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 the heroes as opposed to the bad guys, but uh, there were some characters that came out, call them the Germans, um, and there's a variety of different German soldiers um, that you can get, and I don't know if these are actual Hasbro um, production units or if they came from Palatoy, uh, but there's a number of different uh, German soldiers and such, of which then there was also uh, some motorcycles that had sidecars, German motorcycles with sidecars. Uh, and so there's a number of variations on this as well. Well, that outfit is just looks fantastic in my opinion. Uh, one thing about the German army is they did have some fantastic looking uniforms. Yes. No doubt about that. Uh, now, would I understand that you're not sure if the figure itself is a Hasbro figure, 
but did Hasbro sell clothing or accessories that were German enemy accessories back in the time you were collecting these? Not when I was a little kid, and I'm not sure when these um, German soldiers came out. Judging by the way they look, I'd probably say they might have been 80s or 90s series when they came out, maybe even later after that. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that Palatoy made um, uh, 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 their own variations. There's a um, Green Beret version uh, that has a tank. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a commander and then the driver of the tank and such. Um, so again, there were more accessories that came out. And again, I believe that was more from the UK, which would be most likely Palatoy. Palatoy. Right. And Palatoy, even in the Star Wars collectibles, there's Star Wars action figures that have the Palatoy label. Uh -oh. that they look very similar to the Kenner, but it is a different line. Interesting. I was not aware of that. There, there is that as well. Wow. Yes. So, uh, no enemies for G.I. Joe back in the day. You said there was originally, there was four enemy, or four G.I. Joe that came out, uh, the different, uh, you know, military branches that you could get. What was your motivation to having these collectibles? Why was it G.I. Joe, and why so many G.I. Joe? Well, that motivation these days, which now involves the excessive over-collecting, is just me trying to recapture my childhood. Uh, as a little kid, I didn't have a source of income, so it was just gifts that were given to us. Let me stop you. So are you saying that these G.I. Joe action figures that are behind you here, these are not your original G.I. Joe action figures? That is correct. Um, that would, in the mid-60s, would be... Uh, gosh, as little kids, we were born and raised in Southern California, moved to South Dakota, uh, moved back in the 80s. So a lot of those childhood toys and things kind of got lost along the way or given away. Um, all of this stuff, uh, and as you well know from our Star Wars series, uh, I got into that excessively maybe three years ago. Um, and then once that particular room reached its capacity... Uh, I, I still had the disease, uh, but just didn't have room for more of those, so it spread out here to the living room where I ended up building this cabinet to accommodate this particular display. And then once I kind of reached a, a saturation point with G.I. Joe, then it um, evolved into Hot Wheels, and we'll talk about that at some other point. <laughs> I see, I see. A, a different episode for the Hot Wheels uh, today, G.I. Joe. You know, you brought up, I, in my opinion, uh, I have a few questions based on what you just uh, uh, just stated right there. I, I do want to know, um, since these aren't your childhood collections, and you did go back and recollect them, what was the importance to you, the psychology maybe behind it, of wanting to collect G.I. Joe? Again, uh, kind of trying to recapture that, that, that childhood memory. Um, one of the things... Uh, that, that, that had a significant effect on collecting this stuff was the smell or the, 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 the aroma that came from it. And that sounds weird, uh, but unlike the Star Wars items, which are 99, 100% all plastic, right. um, the G.I. Joes tend to have the variations in the, uh, the uniforms and such, which are cloth. And so the cloth on a lot of these is... 50 and 60 years old and that cloth will either get some mildew on it or stuff that it's collected over the period of time and so there's a bit of a an aroma would be a, a polite word to use uh, but a, a smell that's associated with this and so as you open those boxes that smell came forth and it kind of triggered memory things uh, and so that in itself kind of helps spur on some of that interest in continuing to collect. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Now, you mentioned when you open up the boxes, most of these action figures that you're showing us and that are behind you are loose action figures, but you do have a few boxed figures as well. What's the difference between the loose and the box? Why collect both? Well, when it comes to boxed, unlike Star Wars, where box means the product's not been taken out of the box, with G.I. Joe, you might be lucky if you got the box. Wow. But the product has been taken out of the box many, many years ago. And so the boxes became another item that would be considered a collectible. And these boxes, 
sell by themselves for extremely high dollars um, because they're just unique and probably even more rare uh, than the items themselves. Hmm. And for you personally, uh, what is it? Is it important to have a boxed item or more important to have a loose item? What is your preference when it comes to those two choices? Well, if I had my choice, I'd tend to go with the loose items because ultimately the goal is to collect the Joes. Mm -hmm. uh, the boxes serve as additional uh, decoration, kind of um, uh, uh, validating or fortifying uh, the item. And of course, as with the Star Wars stuff, the G.I. Joe stuff has the artwork that comes with it as well. And I'm going to take and kind of take a step backwards for a moment. Uh, two of the things that really spurred on the, the, the appeal of G.I. Joe as little kids was the marketing manner of which G.I. Joe promoted itself was through commercials and advertisements that showed other little boys playing war or their setups and you can do this with G.I. Joe, and you can do that, and place G.I. Joe in his Jeep and drive over the hill. Terrific equipment to have a battle with. When you get G.I. Joe and the authentic G.I. Joe equipment, you'll have the greatest realism, the greatest fun you ever had in playing soldier. And so that in itself got all of us on Saturday mornings watching cartoons and eating Captain Crunch going, Mom, I gotta have this! Um, and so that's how G.I. Joe was promoted originally, was through its various um, uh, commercials on TV. One of the other things that became very popular once you began to collect these items was the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the fandom or the, the fan club that you could sign up for. Hmm. And you could send away not only for additional information, uh, which would then promote other products within the line, uh, but then there were some things that if you bought a few box tops and sent those in, you might get a particular item that spurred you on to buy the rest of that set. Got it, got it. And, you know, again, there's been many figures that you've shown me here that relate to some of the real American hero action figures. But even this story that you're talking about, how they were advertised on Saturday mornings, G.I. Joe, for my generation, it, they actually came out with a cartoon that was shown on Saturday morning, and basically anything that was in the cartoon, you could go to the store and buy. Yeah. It was it was a 22-minute commercial, yeah. basically, and the fan membership was also part of A Real American Hero, G.I. Joe as well. So many of the things that I reference or I know from G.I. Joe, which I thought were original to me and my collection, it was actually a generation before yeah. where all of it got its start. That is fascinating. I think I have some of the um, promotional literature up here as well, and I might even have some of that uh, uh, membership info um, where you could sign up and such applications if you want to call it. Right. Such. Let's uh, if you have it, show it up on the screen right sure. now. I would love sure. to see some of that. Okay. Okay. Absolutely, uh, really cool stuff here. Uh, the other thing that you had mentioned a few moments earlier was about how you display your GI Joe, and I see that you have kind of like that military green. Uh, shelving that you have here. Where did you get this shelving? Where did you find that? How did all these fit in there so perfectly? Well, so I built the cabinetry myself. Uh, I don't consider myself a great cabinet maker, but I do enjoy cutting wood and assembling things. And I even enjoy just as much building things or assembling or creating the whole uh, experience. And so the cabinetry is three-quarter inch uh, thick pine. Um, it's got a backing on there. The shelf height was made to uh, fit the G.I. Joe's in there with just a little bit of extra room inside there. Uh, the depth was 12 inches, or in this case, whatever, 10 and a half that a piece of 1 by 12 is wide. Um, the look of the cabinet took a little bit of the siding, in particular the color. Uh, it, it seemed to me that a not a foot locker, but a locker of sorts was an appropriate way to uh, blend the G.I. Joe Marine or Army or military thing together with it. Uh, the color um, is a little variation. I think uh, typically the, the, the Army green would be a little bit darker, but to me the Army green didn't blend with the other colors here in the living room. Mm -hmm. And so I had to debate between was it going to be this kind of slightly olive or a pale green 
or was it going to be more of a, a, a tan color? But I decided the green was more military looking. And then, of course, to uh, 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 enhance that, um, there are the uh, logos here on the sides that are stencils, which is typically what you would see in a military uh, application. Everything is stenciled on and spray painted or hand painted. And so those logos were put in there. And of course, the USA, which is very military, militaristic. Um, and the height of the cabinet, if I went any taller, I wouldn't have room to not only display the stuff on top, I'd lose that, but then I would not have had room for all the stuff above. So going four different layers high, about 13 inches each, um, uh, just seemed appropriate for collecting and, and displaying that. But as you can see, I'm way beyond uh, its capacity at that point. But then that's pretty typical of me, to kind of to be <laughs> excessive about everything I do. Wow, that is awesome that you made your own display cabinet for your G.I. Joe. I walked into the room and I thought that was a custom piece that you bought somewhere, but it's a custom piece that you made yourself. Yes, yes. That's really yes. cool. That's, that's, you know, having the whole collection kind of stand out with something that you made to display them. It just that's, that's the way to do it, in my opinion. Uh, bravo to you for having that, to be able to do something like that. Uh, how about as far as how they're displayed in the cabinet? Do you have any type of arrangement or thought between, okay, I'm going to display these here, this is going to go on this shelf, this is going to go on the left side of the shelf, this is going to go on the right side of the shelf? Not really. Uh, probably the only significant aspect of how they're arranged is the older ones or the first ones that I bought which appealed to me. That was what I shot for was the original stuff in the beginning. Might tend to be here on the top and then they're stacked about three deep each inside there and then when the top shelf got full then we moved down to the next shelf and then down to the next shelf. The, the lower shelf has some Unique variations. There's a G.I. Joe lunch pail down there. Mm. Uh, there's a G.I. Joe medical bag down there. Um, there's uh, a couple other uh, masterpiece collection box down there. And then, of course, I have uh, f four different sets of G.I. Joe Jeeps and trailers wow. um, with all of their accessories and such. Um, and, of course, we have yet to start talking about um, the G.I. Joe comics that came out. Um, Those are these, classic comics. That's like 1980, 1981, really yes. classic comics yes. right there. And as with the, uh, the Star Wars, uh, and not so much with the Hot Wheels, but um, uh, these are not, maybe not originals, maybe second uh, editions sure. uh, of the uh, original publications, but at least the first uh, 20 uh, issues uh, are in here. Mm -hmm. um, they were supposed to be displayed in here as well, uh, but Again, the, the excessive amount of stuff I have didn't uh, allow room for it. Interesting. Well, yeah, as, you know, those comments, those actually associate more to the more modern G.I. Joe, the real American hero G.I. Joe that I'm talking about. And I actually knew kids growing up when I was in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade when the G.I. Joe cartoon was on Saturday mornings. And some of the kids, they would watch that, but they were more into the comic books and the stories in the comic books than they ever were in the animated show. So for, I know a lot of people out, here, out there watching, those are very dear to their heart. Interesting. I don't remember reading the comics much myself, and certainly not the G.I. Joe comics, and the Saturday morning cartoons would have been a, a 70s or 80s version which I had then grown older and had kind of gone on to other interests. I think I was 15, 14 or 15 years old when I moved back to the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And so at that point in time, my interest was being able to drive tractors <laughs> and throw hay bales and pitch manure, making money, sure. uh, as opposed to sitting at home watching some, uh, cartoons and such. Definitely a decade or so gap in between when you were growing up and when a real American hero and yes. those kids were growing up. Yes. Uh, no issue with that, but again, I find it just so interesting how a lot of the origins of what I know of G.I. Joe actually started much, much earlier. And I think some of the people watching this also are going to be fascinated by that fact. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and then there's a, a couple of things I wanted to point out. Again, the original G.I. Joes had molded hair, um, which was part of the actual body, and the variations would be in the form of 
painting the different colors of hair there. Mm -hmm. um, there was a point where they ended up going to uh, what's called the fuzzy haired fellow, yeah. um, which I don't know how they attached it, but it's more realistic, real life hair. And one of the things that I found interesting was you could um, trim or shave this off a little bit yourself wow. and make slightly custom variations on there. If you wanted to go to G.I. Joe, you could ultimately do that, I guess. Exactly. exactly. Take that razor, and uh, yeah. here you go. And somewhere in there, I bought one that has a, uh, a unique um, trim arrangement really? in there. Um, but, um, if you can't find it now, we'll pull it up as a picture, possibly, uh, when uh, we're, we're showing these off. Um, and there are Look at that some guy. Joes that are really quite lavishly decorated in their uh, various outfits. This being a pilot G.I. Joe with his compression suit on. He's got his um, uh, parachute, parachute pack on the right. back there. He's got his uh, gas or ox oxygen mask yep. on there. And uh, he's got his um, a life vest there with his flight suit. Um, so they really kind of uh, very authentically replicated uh, a lot of the accessories. And some of them are uh, uh, pretty extreme in what they come with. Um, there's a whole plethora of um, 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 uh, pistols uh, as well as uh, rifles and such. Uh, helmets is another thing that people really, um, and some of these helmets are very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, you can also find reproduction items of some of this stuff. But as with the Star Wars stuff, you kind of have to decide what is your, your goal in collecting, and that is a, to have the original versions or, in my case, with a lot of Star Wars stuff, it was acceptable for me to have reproduced items just to complete the set for the appearance of it. Right, right. How about for G.I. Joe? Are you okay to have reproduced, or are you looking really for original items? Um, I think I tried to hold out for original stuff, right. and even though I can be a little on the excessive side as far as collecting and such and some of the accessories, I don't remember excessively looking for reproduction stuff. Uh, it might have been in the case of, and I don't recall uh, if this is an original helmet or from the military police or not, uh, but I do remember looking at them at one point in time. Um, and price-wise, with a lot of Star Wars stuff, there's an advantage cost-wise because it's much lower for reproduction stuff. Right. Uh, for GI Joe, I don't remember there being much of an advantage of buying a reproduction. Oh, okay. Uh, cost-wise, so uh, other reproduce. than the fact of being able to have it to complete your collection. Right. So you know, every time that you talk about something or show another figure, I get a swell of uh, nostalgia that hits me. Uh, the pilot action figure that you pulled up there that looks very much like Airborne who was a very popular real American hero G.I. Joe action figure. I think he came out in like 1984, and he looks almost identical to that action figure right there. So that seeing that is the origin of Airborne. Yes, and, and I kind of think the advantage of uh, reproducing some of those characters um, would be from a manufacturing standpoint, not only is it a new generation that's coming about, uh, but that newer generation um, is looking for something that's specific to them. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, uh, from a manufacturing standpoint, cost to manufacture, say, a six inch figure or a three and three quarter inch figure is less than a 12 inch figure. And of course, from a packaging standpoint, there's a cost savings there. Mm -hmm. um, and so now you can take the original uh, versions and reproduce those by either making them smaller or packaging them slightly differently and then marketing the same ones to a, the next generation. And the other thing I did want to uh, mention as well, another nostalgia moment, is when you talked about the accessories and the helmets. Uh, obviously Star Wars and the Star Wars figures were big back in the early 80s, but a lot of times you only got one pistol or one pew pew with them. Some of them, maybe a Luke Skywalker came with a, a pistol and also a lightsaber, but for the most part, accessory-wise, you were getting one accessory per Star Wars figure. One thing I do remember about G.I. Joe when it started coming out is you'd get a ton of accessories in there. There'd be the different rifles, the different pistols, maybe an animal, 
maybe some sort of, uh, you know, clothing type of apparatus, and then also a helmet or a goggle, a lot of different accessories, again, born from these early stages of G.I. Joe. Yes, and I believe part of that was also a, a, a marketing decision on their part. Again, they would market the, the base version of G.I. Joe uh, and then offer all the variety of accessories, mm -hmm. whether it be different costumes or different um, uh, uh, rifles or different canteens and things like that. Um, so maybe unlike the Star Wars stuff where there's not a, a defined market of accessories available, uh, within G.I. Joe, that was part of the selling idea, was to offer the accessories. Because again, the base foundation was G.I. Joe himself, call him the naked version. Mm -hmm. And then you could purchase different accessories to create different variations of G.I. Joe, uh, or for different scenes and such. Got it, got it. And what's in your hand now? I'm looking at George Washington G.I. Joe. Well, this was another variation, and I don't know if this is a Hasbro-made product, but as they expanded that line, there became other variations available. This being George Washington, he's complete, including his musket and his little um, saber there. He is missing his um, the hat, and there's a name for what they call that hat that he used to wear, kind of a Captain Crunch kind of a cap of sorts. Okay. Um, and... Um, uh, there's a line of Civil War um, uh, G.I. Joes as well. Uh, I, again, don't know if they're manufactured by Hasbro, uh, but that Civil War line is extensive. Mm -hmm. uh, the Revolutionary War, I don't think, is anywhere near as big. Uh, over here uh, is a rifle rack that you could load a bunch of different of your various rifles and such inside there. Right. And I do remember, again, from the Real American Hero line of G.I. Joe, certain uh, accessories and certain vehicles or play sets came with rifle racks, very similar to what you're showing right there. Yes. Yeah. And there were, um, uh, I think we'll call them sets or scenes where you could buy um, a, a, a pup tent uh, or a communication stand. In fact, um, there was a, a, a kit, for lack of a better description, that as you open it up, it was a communications uh, command post that as you open it up, it became um, kind of the guard booth and probably had a, um, a, a gate that you had to open and close to allow your guy to go through. And of course, it had all the decorations on mm -hmm. there. So again, accessories in G.I. Joe was a big part uh, of the sales of G.I. Joe. Okay, so it has, as it was in the 60s, as it was in the 80s, another thing that came out and around in the 80s, which again, I understand it's a generational difference, but a lot of uh, the G.I. Joe action figures were female G.I. Joe action figures. Did they do any female G.I. Joe in the 60s? Yes and no. Um, so again, there was the stigma of boys don't play with dolls. Mm. And so the whole line was centered around the male uh, version of, of dolls. Um, at one point in time, uh, Hasbro decided that they might be able to attract some f girls mm. who were beginning to play with G.I. Joe into that realm of product line, and so they made a G.I. Joe nurse. Okay. Bombed. Ah. It never sold. Interesting. So the girls weren't going for it, and the boys avoided it as well. That is correct. Now, the irony, <laughs> it's the most expensive G.I. Joe you can purchase these days. Oh, wow. Okay. It is an original G.I. Joe nurse. They didn't sell then, but now they're hard to get because they're so expensive. Yes. Yeah. I've seen them over $1,000 wow. on eBay and such before. Um, this here happens to be a female G.I. Joe. Um, I think it's a, a Chinese counterfeit version. I don't remember... Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier. So like a dragon ball dragon or something. Dragon something like yeah, that. Right. Um, it's the only female G.I. Joe that I actually have at the moment. Okay. Um, but, but not an original Hasbro nurse G.I. Joe. No. No. Okay. I could not afford that. You know, and the other thing going uh, into kind of this next generation of G.I. Joe that they did, not only did they have many women like Lady Jane uh, and other women as well, Scarlet, but uh, they also had uh, black G.I. Joes. Obviously, being in the early 1960s, was a black G.I. Joe a thing? Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. you know, not only to accommodate, but to bring in different ethnicities, for lack of sure. a better description. Right. 
uh, be smart on the marketing department. If you're a nine-year-old boy, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. Yes, yes. exactly. And you know how many uh, uh, Asian kids or black kids were playing with white uh, toys? Right. I mean, uh, when something came that, that spoke to them, uh, that was uh, kindred to them, mm -hmm. uh, they found it quite appealing. And so there was a, a, a black G.I. Joe, and I believe there is also a Japanese G.I. Joe uh, who comes in a, like a samurai uh, kind of an outfit. Uh, oh. Maybe samurai is not the right word. Uh, there's a word uh, that I can't think of at the moment that describes the more typical World War II mm -hmm. Japanese fighter. Uh, but uh, he's very authentic in the outfit that he has. Uh, if I remember right, uh, was it shorts? Or, or no, it was uh, laced boots, I think, is uh, one of the things that stood out to me the most. And then there was something about a cap that was very... Uh, uh, reminiscent of what the typical Japanese okay. fighter looked like. Got it. But in your hand right here, this is like an original roadblock right there. Yes. <laughs> the roadblock, I assume, would be the more current version. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, uh, that's, that's very, very cool. Yeah, I don't recall these guys having any specific names. Mm -hmm. um, as I am sitting here looking at this fellow, there is something that does stand out, and I'd like to emphasize it. One of the things, and I believe... This may have something to do with, technically, from a patent standpoint, that differentiated G.I. Joe uh, action figure from many other dolls is not only the points of articulation, but in particular the scar that's on the cheek. Hmm. Uh, and this set G.I. Joe apart from all the other dolls. Um, unless you found a Ricky Bobby uh, from a, and I don't even know if they even make that, but I'm just saying a, a car wreck Ricky Bobby that might be destroyed that's missing an arm or something like that, G.I. Joe would be one of the very few uh, toys that has a wound or a particular scar on there defining him as G.I. Joe. Wow. Wow. That's a little bit of history right there that I had no clue about. And I don't think that did transfer over to the real American hero, G.I. Joe's. I can't remember much scarring on the G.I. Joe's. Interesting. Because um, yes. it's a very um, a significant point mm -hmm. uh, in, having, in recognizing the difference between G.I. Joe and someone else. And is it always on the face where you find the scar? Or yes. Can it be always on the face? Yes. Got it. Got it. Uh, I vaguely recall a, a latter series of G.I. Joe's that had um, Atomic Bob or, or Atomic something G.I. Joe mm -hmm. uh, that has, and it might have been in that period of time with um, the Six Million Dollar Man, uh, that has a rebuilt arm, uh, a mechanical arm or a robot arm. Uh, and so, I'm not going to use the phrase disfigured, but a figure that is uh, uh, not 100% uh, um, uh, complete yeah. uh, as he was born. Some war wound, A war wound of some sort. Right, right. Interesting. You know, another figure that I'm seeing back behind you there, it looks like a ski G.I. Joe, or at least a snow G.I. Joe with skis. Very, very reminiscent of a character named Snow Job in <laughs> the original G.I. or the, the real American hero G.I. Joe. You have to be careful when you say that name. Snow job. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the original snow job in your hand right there. Yes. Um, and there's a few, uh, a number of accessories for these uh, long uh, skis, uh, short skis. You've got the poles. You've got the, um, uh, what do you call those little uh, walker things on the back? Snow feet or something like that. Um, Snowshoes. Snowshoes. There we go. Um, you've got the various accessories and the outfits. Um, and these had a particular uh, name or series, Arctic, um, might have been what it was that yeah. they came out with as well. Again, that kind of just goes right into the next generation of G.I. Joe. Very, very interesting to see the Arctic G.I. Joe and knowing that Snow Job and the Arctic Cat and so many different G.I. Joe accessories, vehicles, figures are geared towards the snow. These are the originals right here. And the opposite uh, end of the spectrum or hemisphere would be the um, uh, Australian G.I. Joe or the Desert Fighter G.I. Joe um, that's dressed a little bit, uh, uh, not as heavily and such. Wow, very, very cool. Looks kind of like Raincore from, uh, I, I think his name is Raincore. If I'm wrong about it being Raincore, please correct me in the comments. 
Uh, but again, I think he was an Australian outback G.I. Joe from the Real American Hero line. Came out maybe in around 1985. But that's the original one right there. Very, very cool. Another thing I am seeing over there as well is it looks like a, uh, a G.I. Joe that's kind of dressed in his marine blues, I think they call it. Uh, kind of, he's not out for battle, but more of like a G.I. Joe that you would see like at the academy or something like that. What's up with that one? Kind of a parade, mm -hmm. uh, G.I. Joe, I think there's a more appropriate name for it, but he would be dressed in his uh, uh, more official uh, outfit and such. Uh, again, there was a wide variation of different costumes offered, um, and they all paralleled uh, what typically the military branches uh, would offer as such, um, ranging from general daily fatigues to dress uniforms. Mm -hmm. And speaking of this particular G.I. Joe, a very popular G.I. Joe from the Real American Hero line, dressed in his marine blues, is Gung Ho. Uh -huh. And that's an original Gung Ho right there, it looks uh -huh. like. <laughs> Does he have a, a tattoo on his chest by any chance? No. No, okay. The Gung Ho of today does have a tattoo, but there is an action figure that came out in, like, in 1986, I would say, of uh, uh, dress blue Gung Ho. Looks just like that. Wow. Very, very cool. So, you know, I'm looking at all these different action figures, all these different G.I. Joes. Take us back a little bit. Uh, where do you even find these when you want to start collecting 1960s G.I. Joes? Where should I go to collect these guys? For me, I think one of the best places is eBay. Mm -hmm. um, there's a wide variety of people offering a wide variety of things. Uh, to uh, take on one of eBay's comments, um, we've got everything. Seriously, we've got everything. Uh, and so you can find, at least I find, just about everything that I'm looking for uh, on eBay. And granted, you could find um, uh, certain websites, let's talk about Star Wars for just a brief moment, and go to Hasbro Pulse. You might find current versions of uh, Star Wars items, but you're not going to find the original vintage stuff uh, there, it's all going to be new stuff. Um, so you have to seek out. Now, other people might go to um, Facebook Marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, other people might go to the local toy store. Uh, I think it tends to depend upon how you came into that collecting era uh, or, or hobby and where you're located. Through our Star Wars interviews, we found that, um, uh, and I commented about this last night to a fellow we spoke in China, uh, that people from Australia tend to buy and sell a lot of their stuff, Facebook Marketplace, mm -hmm. and then patronize the local toy stores. Mm -hmm. um, on the East Coast, uh, there are a lot of people who, um, 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 Hasbro Pulse or uh, what's that one, Something Earth, mm -hmm. uh, that they'll buy that stuff from, and then they heavily patronize the local toy stores. Um, Again, I kind of like eBay. Maybe I'm a, a, a lazy shopper because I can sit there and, and, and hunt on my keyboard uh, and just select stuff and pay for it, and it magically arrives by the postman. <laughs> sure. um, other people like to go out and what they call a, a shop in the wild or seek out stuff in the wild. The hunt. The hunt. Uh, whether that be um, a, a garage sale or a yard sale. Uh, to me, the garage sales and the yard sales always involve getting up at the crack of dawn, mm -hmm. uh, because first come, first serve. Um, but then again, on the other hand, if you're the first one there, um, the people are asking for the high end of whatever they're going to charge for it. Whereas if you're later on in the day, the selection <laughs> might be less, but then again, the price comes down as well. A flight director here with his colorful outfit, he's got his uh, life vest on there and the flags for directing the, um, uh, the planes in and out and his binoculars for seeking out. One of the other things that I did want to mention, which was always one of the um, frustrations uh, of having G.I. Joes, uh, and it, it's sometimes a challenge to get these costumes or uniforms on and off, but the hardest thing is getting the boots on and off. Mm. Um, there's variations in the boots size-wise, and then there's a, a particular way that the boots go on and off. Mm. Um, but it was always, and I remember this as I was assembling these guys that as a kid trying to get the boots on and off was always an interesting feat. No pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> got it, got it. 
And uh, who sees your collection? You know, I know that your house is filled with multiple different collections, but we're talking about the G.I. Joe collection today. Who sees the G.I. Joe collection? Well, as with most uh, uh, collectors, very few people see these collections. Um, and the joke is the gas man when he comes to check the meter, um, or an unknowing visitor shows up, and of course the first thing they walk in, they see this, and it's like, oh my God. Um, and so it's always a real pleasure on my part to show people my collections, and in particular stand back and look at their reactions to them. Got it. Yeah, I was going to ask what do they normally say about the collection, but I think you pantomimed it quite well that they're just kind of speechless, mouth agape. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, one of my final questions I do want to ask you is, uh, do you have any interesting or most unexpected story that you can share with us regarding your G.I. Joe collection? Other than simply the joy uh, of, of receiving them and what they kind of spurred on when I originally saw them as I bought them and did that, 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 that memory uh, continue. Uh, but the, the, the sad irony is, as a collector, um, it's, it's really the excitement is the hunt, seeking out the stuff. So you decided today or you stumbled across this particular G.I. Joe from this particular era or this uh, Star Wars collectible from this particular collection and the first thing you do is you try to find comparisons. Okay, so this guy has something I'd like. He's asking X amount of dollars. Uh, let me go out and look around and see what similar items or same items are selling for with other people. And I have found many times in the past uh, that the initial one you stumble on is higher than something if you look around a little bit. Um, with eBay and places that you buy online, there's the shipping cost aspect of it. Some of it is free shipping, uh, some of it is, is uh, charge for shipping, some of it is excessive shipping, some of it is very affordable shipping. Um, and then there would be the condition. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm going to generally call the hunt. And that's really where a lot of collectors find the excitement. Uh, like yourself, I'm sure that uh, I, you've sat there like I have and spent hours in front of the computer looking for these comparisons and doing your own personal research. And again, that's loosely referred to as the hunt. Yeah. And that's where most people find the great excitement Probably the only bigger excitement is when you narrowed it down and decided this is the one I'm going to get, and that moment you press the button uh, to, to, to make the purchase, two things go through your mind. Oh, the joy that I'm going to get this, and then two, oh my God, how much money did I just spend? Sure, um, sure. Or am I continuing to spend, or when am I going to slow down in spending? Um, and so probably the hunt is probably the interesting thing, uh, or the most fun. The irony to receiving the item um, is, to me, it's exciting to get it, and oh, I've got it, and I look at it, and then I put it on the shelf and walk away and start looking for the next one. Um, so receiving it is just the satisfaction that I now have it, but it's nowhere near the excitement of when I was seeking it out. Um, what happens to me is I move through these various collections and I remember this very vividly. I'm, I'm in the aquarium business, and I would purchase corals online. And I had the same problem there. I would buy to an excess. And it got to the point where, as the stuff began to arrive, and the funny thing is the postman is jokingly always telling me um, you know, he, that I don't like him because I have to make him turn off his truck, he's got to get out of his seatbelt, out of the truck, bring things to the front door. Uh, if he can fit it into the mailbox, he'll shove as much in there that he can so he doesn't have to get out of the truck. But I'll get this, these piles, boxes, two, three, four, five, six boxes at a time. And I found as I began to, the appeal faded in that aspect of collecting that things didn't get opened up right away. Mm. They might have sat there for a day before I went and opened it up. And just recently, I've kind of 
uh, managed to curtail uh, the next version of my collecting disease, which was Hot Wheels, and I found myself thinking about the same thing. Okay, there's another box I gotta go open up again. And so receiving the stuff I don't think is as exciting, at least to me, right. as seeking it out. Got it. Uh, and I do think that is a very individual type thing with you. Uh, some people may feel that same way, that the hunt is more exciting than actually receiving. But for personally myself, I do enjoy the hunt, although I don't necessarily consider it an online hunt. To me, the hunt is out, out, out in the wild trying to find something. But I understand the online hunt. But I love when I actually receive the package. I'm able to open the package a lot of the times on another YouTube channel called Jack in the Box, where I receive a box and we find out what's in the box. We open it together. Uh, but also sharing the collection once I have it on display somewhere. Some of my best personal satisfaction is to have somebody come over, look at the collection, ask about the collection, and then I'm sharing the collection with the person at that point. To me, that's the most exciting aspect of the collection. Yes, I agree with you. And uh, you and I just did an interview with a fellow from China last night, and one of the things that he uh, uh, told us was that he enjoyed having that time sharing his experiences with us online because he normally did not get that with his local where he lived and then even more so uh, correct me if i'm wrong but uh, in the star wars realm um that's really not that popular uh, where he is in china right. um whereas here in the states it is um maybe in australia it is or in the uk it is but for whatever reason and it, it may just be the competitive uh aspects of all the products that are available in china or or wherever the collector is but again he enjoyed the time spending with us mm -hmm. because he didn't get that locally from his other friends well i think that's one of the things that's great about star wars collections and displays this channel specifically is it does give collectors an opportunity to share their collections not just with jim and i but to other collectors and ultimately the entire world out there on youtube uh, Jim, I do have to say this has been a fascinating look at G.I. Joe, and I know personally for myself and for other people out there that are huge fans of a real American hero G.I. Joe, seeing this original stuff is a fascina fascinating, fascinating look at where the origins of G.I. Joe really came from. Yes, and, and the foundations is always exciting, and then building on that foundation uh, is even just as exciting. And maybe at some point, you being, for lack of a better description, would be the next generation of collectors. And I'm sure you've got some G.I. Joe stuff as well. Maybe we turn the cameras around or turn the questions around and interview you and your variation on G.I. Joe. And there might be others out there uh, who see this video that would like to share their collection. And I encourage you to make it a point to contact us. You can leave comments down below in this uh, about this episode whether I'm right or wrong in some of the information I've given. Maybe you've got uh, a little bit more information that you can share or maybe you yourself would like to share your collection with us of which we would then be able to do uh, either a in-person version if you happen to be in the San Fernando Valley area of Los Angeles or we have the ability to do like a, a Zoom interview. Absolutely. And I'll remind everyone that's watching this interview right now, if you've made it this far in the video, go ahead and like this video. Obviously, there's something that you like about this, so give us that like. As Jim said, any comments or questions, please do that in the comments down below. We'll make sure to look at those, answer any questions that you have, reply to any comments that you have. Lastly, subscribe to this channel. At this point, you can binge watch a ton of different interviews of different collectors, mainly Star Wars, that go through their collections, some of it vintage, some of it retro collections, some of it vintage collection, some of it lightsabers, some of it helmets, some of it Lego, we've got it all. Binge watch, subscribe, like Star Wars collections and displays. Jim, thank you very much for your time today. Love this collection. You are more than welcome and best to you all and look forward to hearing from you and seeing a lot more down the road.